So how'd that go? Any uh, comments, insights? It was what? What was hard? Focus? Yeah. Irene? Oh, okay. Good. Janet, you had your hand up, or did you? Oh, okay. Help you praying for somebody. Yeah. Oh, good. Very good. Good. More holistic, right? Yeah. Good. Joel? That's a good point. encourage you in doing this and you'll find it comes more easily naturally the more um, the more you do it I find myself just falling into this this pattern of, of prayer um, but okay did did uh, anybody while while praying you're trying to focus but your mind kept would go somewhere else okay interesting interesting thing and Luther writes about this in, in simple way to pray um, is my next point there? Is it a wandering mind or a leading of the spirit? Okay, so it could be one. It might be the other. And and Luther writes about this in his own prayer life that sometimes he would not get through all the petitions because he would be led to really dig down deep on one of them and and look at that as I think this is what the spirit wants me to do today. So. Prayer is interaction, communication with God, and God might want to get involved <laughs> So, in terms of, of leading us. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah, he wants to. So, so a thought that may come to mind while you're praying, okay, I don't know if this is, is where your mind went, but just as, you know, as an example, Joel, so you're praying daily bread, and you start thinking about, you know, I should probably be providing daily bread. Okay. It's that, that's that kind of thing, and I have had that experience all the time where I'm praying about something and another thought comes or my mind goes another way. And, you know, I come to have a, that, have a, like an expectation that, okay, this may be the Lord, okay? So when I'm, well, I'll get to my, my daily prayer time in a little bit, but uh, 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 it manifests itself in that. So it may be a wandering mind. <laughs> it may be God wants to lead you to think about something. Um, or to pray about something, or to to uh, pray specifically for somebody. You decide to pray for one person, but you keep thinking about somebody else. Well, go with it. <laughs> okay. And sometimes what may be a distraction, you know, like I'm trying to pray, but I keep thinking about this meeting coming up. I don't want to think about the meeting. I'm already stressed about it as it is. I need to pray. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> God wants me to take that meeting to Him in prayer. And pray about it. Oh, okay. So, uh, so, so there's. I don't want to to look at this this methodology, this pattern as being rigid, 
and that, that you do it wrong if you skip a step or you don't get through all of them. Uh, it's, it's a structure to serve our prayer life following Jesus' pattern, uh, but um, the Spirit may lead us in a different direction. Key is giving Him time to do that. Prayer not being hurried. Okay, so we're going to move on because the time is just flying by. <laughs> What's that? We have, to we have to hurry now. I know. <laughs> so enough of that. Stop praying. <laughs> um, the next part is of the uh, simple way to pray is praying the Ten Commandments. And oh, I got another handout. I'm supposed to give you. This is this is um, interesting little tool for self-examination. Okay, what I'm giving you is a, uh, it's a self-examination and reflection tool based on the Ten Commandments and Luther's explanation of the Ten Commandments in the Catechism. If you're ever feeling like you're doing pretty well, use this. <laughs> It'll knock you down, <laughs> okay? Uh, but anyway, that's the, the idea is I'm, I'm giving that to you. We're not going to go through it in, in detail, Okay. Um, but uh, it's some examination questions um, that uh, are helpful in um, just thinking through, am I living this? Remember, we went through the Ten Commandments, I mean, went through the, the Lord's Prayer. To use the Lord's Prayer in prayer, we've got to understand the prayer. To use the Ten Commandments, we've got to understand them. And that they mean much more than the simple word. As Jesus explained <clears throat> in the Sermon on the Mount, and, and Luther just runs with that in his explanation. You know, for instance, um, you shall not kill. We do not go, oh, I haven't murdered anybody, so I got that one down. Okay, cross that off the list. <laughs> okay. It's a whole lot more than that. Jesus says, Jesus in some of the mount says, oh, you got a grudge? You got anger in your heart? You're a, you're a murderer. <laughs> Ooh. Okay. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> so... So those, those, those uh, examination questions can be very, very helpful. So, okay, what Luther would do, though, with the Ten Commandments, and this is, this is really neat, um, is a four-part meditation, a, a four-part reflection. He called it a garland of four strands. And what he'd do is go through the commandments, and for each one, first a reflection, a prayer of reflection or instruction, he would call it, I call it reflection, um, speaking back to God what he instructs in this commandment. Okay? Oh, Lord, you've called on us not to kill other people, not to murder other people, Lord, but I know that you mean more than just that. You mean also that I'm not to harm them and and do damage to them in, in any kind of way, even in my heart or desire to. It's that, that kind of thing, okay? So, praying that way. Then, thanksgiving. Thanking God for, uh, for the commandment. Um, and thanking Him for the blessing uh, that it is in our lives that we have that commandment. So, thanksgiving. Oops, went too far. Confession is to actually confess <laughs> where you have fallen short of the commandment. <coughs> Depending on the commandment and the person, yeah. very, very well may be. Um, and then uh, finally the uh, fifth, the fourth part is petition. Praying, Lord, help me keep the commandment. So you see you're taking the commandment and you're really tearing it apart. You are spending time thinking about what it means. You're turning it into worship, praising God for it, confessing your sin, and then also praying that you keep it. Now, I'm looking at, I'm going to give you an example from, from Luther. Um, let's see, what's a good one? It's not too long. Okay. Seventh commandment. I'm looking at here. It's on page 9. 
you shall not steal. First, I can learn here that I must not take my neighbor's property from him or possess it against his will, either in secret or openly. I must not be false or dishonest in business, service, or work, nor profit by fraud. I must support myself by the sweat of my brow, eat my bread in honor. Furthermore, I must see to it that in any of the above-named ways, my neighbor is not defrauded, just as I wish for myself. I also learned this commandment that God, in his fatherly solicitude, sets a protective hedge around my goods and solemnly prohibits anyone to steal from me. Where that is ignored, he has imposed a penalty and has placed the gallows and the rope in the hands of Jack the Hangman. I love the way he writes. Where that cannot be, be done, God himself meets out punishment and they become beggars in the end, as the Proverbs say, who steals in his youth goes begging in old age. And stolen gain goes down the drain. Okay, that's the first part. He's reflecting on that. In addition, I give thanks for his steadfast goodness and that he has given such excellent teachings, assurance, and protection to me and all the world. If it were not for his protection, not a penny or crumb of bread would be left in the house. So this commandment, you shall not steal, he turns into praise. Lord, thank you for that commandment because it protects my stuff. I, I, <laughs> do we think about that? <laughs> you know? Third, I confess my sins and ingratitude in such instances where I have wronged, deprived, or cheated anyone in my life. He's been pretty comprehensive his whole life. Fourth, I ask that he grant to me and all the world grace to learn from this commandment, to ponder it, and to become better people, so that there may be less theft, robbery, usury, cheating, and injustice, and that the judgment day for which all saints and the whole creation pray, Romans 8, shall soon bring this to an end. Amen. So he's using it about his own life, but in his society and his community as well. You know, so this commandment would be, um, you know, pray for, you know, the thieves to be stopped. <laughs> pray for the police to catch them <laughs> and so forth. So, do you see that here, what, what we're doing here? Four parts, reflection, thanksgiving, confession, uh, supplication. Now, this is not necessarily one... Um, well, let's see, we're going to, what time, what, how much time do we have? Okay, well, we're going to skip over, we're going to keep moving on, we're going to talk about the next one, and then we're going to go back and, and give some time to practice both of these, or try out both of these, because they use the same, the same methodology. So this is the Ten Commandments. He also talks about, in a simple way to pray, praying the creed which is similar to the Lord's Prayer in, in reflecting on and thanking God uh, for the gifts. We're not going to spend time on that this morning. Uh, you can read that um, in his simple way to pray. Um, but, for instance, praying the first part of the creed of thanking God for creation and praying to God that I use creation wisely and to his glory. Second article, thanking Jesus for saving me and, uh, and praying that I could be faithful and, and sharing that with others. So, using it as a, a model for prayer. So that is praying the commandments. The next one is not in Luther's method, but something that I have done in applying Luther's four-strand garland to Scripture in general. And this is, this is uh, um, probably one of the, this is a real big part of my prayer time. So the same four things. Reflection. A prayer of reflection speaking back to God what he instructs in the text. Thanksgiving. A prayer of thanksgiving to God for the revelation in the text. Third, confession. Praying uh, of confession for any sins brought to mind in meditating on the text. And then finally, petition, praying for the Lord's strength and guidance in living the truth contained in the text. It is a way of meditating on the text of Scripture and turning it into prayer. There are, I'll, I'll just point this out, this is, this is one method. This is one that I use. Um, I just got in the habit of using it when reading the, you know, Luther's method. There are many, many others that other people have come up with of ways of turning Scripture into prayer. And perhaps at upcoming workshops, we'll look at some of those as well. Um, but this is a simple four-part way. Reflecting it back to God, thanking Him for it, confessing any sin that comes to mind, and praying that, you help, help, that He helps you apply it. Okay. 
Let me give you an example. 1 John 4.10, down there at the bottom. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Okay, I will give an example. Reflection. Lord, you're teaching me here in this verse what love really is all about. That love doesn't really come from me and how well I love you, but love comes from you and how well you love me and love us in sending Jesus to go to the cross for our sins. Okay, so I just reflected it, put it in my own words. Thanksgiving. I thank you, God, for this. I thank you for uh, for. Jesus dying for me, for the forgiveness that I have, but that in doing so, you've also given me this picture, enduring picture of love, and a reminder of what love is. Whenever I see a cross, whenever I think of Jesus' sacrifice, I have before me a picture of what true love really is. Okay, so I'm thanking God. Confession. I know I need to grow in this because I have fallen short. I have not loved those around me the way you have loved me. Um, And what I've said, what I've done, my thoughts, I've been selfish and have not been the loving person that uh, your love for me is supposed to work in me. So I ask your forgiveness. And then finally, petition. Help me to love. Help me to love the way you love. Help me to be reminded whenever I see the cross that I am to love the people around me, even those that irritate me, even those that have sinned against me. Help me to love them and help me more and more in my life to be shaped by your incredible love. Amen. Okay, so I take that one verse and it becomes prayer. It's a way of of meditating on it, and allowing it to, to sink in and then shape. Let's do another one. I'm going to give you another example because this is, this is, for me, this is so important, being able to do this. John 15, 1 to 4, one of our favorite verses in the Napa Valley, favorite passages. I'm the true vine, my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean of the word because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. You're teaching me a lot here, Lord. You're teaching me that you're a gardener and I'm a vine, a branch, and that you're at work and you want to be at work pruning me so that I'm more fruitful. You're teaching me here that it's your word that cleans me, um, but that I need to remain in you. It's not just I'm forgiven so I'm, I'm okay forever. I need to remain in you uh, so that I can bear fruit because I can't bear fruit without you. I have to remain connected to you. Thanksgiving. I thank you for this teaching. I thank you for, the, for this word about pruning because things happen in my life that are difficult. And your teaching me this helps me understand that sometimes, Lord, you take things away and you prune me and you lead me through difficult times so that I'll be more fruitful. So I, I thank you for teaching me this and helping me to understand it. I uh, thank you for your word that cleans me and forgives me. But I, I thank you above all for this invitation to remain in you so that I can be fruitful. Um, okay, that is Thanksgiving, confession. I confess that uh, sometimes remaining in you doesn't go the way you'd want and I get lazy, and I put off being in your word, I put off prayer time, I get perfunctory in what I do, not really allow your word to prune and speak to me, um, 
I get to thinking, Lord, uh, that, that I can do this without you. And I don't take to heart and live the truth of what you're saying here, that I will be absolutely fruitless and only fit to be tossed aside unless I'm remaining in you always. I confess and ask your forgiveness. And then a supplication, a petition. Help me remain in you. Help me to remain in you and to, to be connected to you so that I can be fruitful in all my relationships, in all that I do. Remind me again and again to remain in you that I may bear fruit. Amen. Okay. See how that leads you like deeper into the text <laughs> and, and thinking about it and applying it to life? Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. That's a pretty long passage to do that with. Okay. Um, normally when I, what I do, well, let me get that in a minute. What I, what I do real quickly is, is a shorter, you know, a verse or two, a verse or two. It's fun to do that with a memory verse, you know, for the week um, or a, a just a passage. When I, my reading that I do each day, I look for something that jumps out at me and then dig in deep this way. But a helpful way to turn it into prayer. Okay, we're going to take a little bit of time here. Um, again, I'm going to stop talking and give you some um, private time, about 15 minutes, to try out the fourfold method. And it's up to you how you try it out. You can try it out with a commandment uh, or try it out with a scripture passage. I put three suggestions here, two from the Psalms, one 1 Corinthians 13, the very familiar um, love passage. Uh, but go ahead and try it out, and we will reconvene at 11.37.